Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. Glad you could join me on our weekly adventure into the field and the forests with our favorite hunting buddies, our dogs. I'm Scott Linden, your host. Fascinating show in store for you. Let's go ptarmigan hunting. Or should I say ptarmigan hunting? Maybe we'll learn why it's spelled that way, among other things, from Christine Cunningham. She's an expert by virtue of her living in Alaska, among other things. So I'm looking forward to learning way more about this fascinating bird and uh, what it does, how it does it, and why it does it, and how we can hunt them. We'll also cover a public access question on where to find quail in Kansas. I'll share some fascinating data on who mentors whom in our world and a bunch of news you can use from dreams and what they mean to congratulations to the Duluth Retriever Club. 75 years old this year, celebrating, oh, most recently. Keep up the good work, everybody. Boy, I'll tell you, I have enjoyed every minute of the association I have with the dog clubs that I am uh, active with. And if you're not active with one yet, I don't care how antisocial you are. You will learn something, find somebody out there to hunt with, and uh, hopefully you'll do some good in the conservation world as well. So, <clears throat> yeah, had another fire real close to the place. You know, you can always... Thank goodness. Thank you, John, for alerting me every time he sees smoke. And then I hop on the little electric motorcycle and head south. Seems like it's always heading south. Two miles from our place, yet another forest fire. By the time I got there, nobody needed any help. There were five engines, one tanker, a bulldozer, four different public resource agencies, and about 35 guys with Pulaski's and, um, and other hand tools. They got the job done before anybody else needed to. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's that time of year. You know, there is no such thing as an off season when it comes to fire these days. So please be careful out there. And um, if you haven't seen it, I, I, I'm really excited about my association with a, a magazine you may not have heard of very often called Hook and Barrel. Fascinating organization. Thank you, John and Lee, for all your encouragement there. It's available at a lot of the Bass Pro Shops. It's available online, and it's also available by subscription. Enjoyed the heck out of writing a story on, uh, I'll loosely call them Legends of the Fall. Yeah, I know. No, I didn't realize there was a movie by that title as well until I finished the piece. But if you like uh, kind of the, the mystical side of the hunting world, you might check it out. It was a lot of fun to research and write. And uh, um, yeah, you might learn something there. Anyway, speaking of learning something, in our most recent Upland Nations Insight newsletter, I asked a question that I've been meaning to ask for a while. If you had one, who was or who is your hunting mentor? fascinated by the results there as it should be as it has been for decades it's a cliche but it's also true most of the respondents echo the national trend our father was our mentor in 46 percent of the cases next highest on the list a friend at 24 percent and then after that, it trickles down to uncles and aunts, brothers and sisters, sons or daughters, uh, grandparents. Uh, yeah, I'm frankly surprised the grandparent thing didn't uh, rate a little higher. About 9% of us were mentored by a grandparent of one sort or another. Uh, mother, about 3%. So anyway, that's how it works. Uh, if you're a father and you're not mentoring a child, um, Likelihood is nobody else will, so consider that uh, at least a gentle nudge in the direction of creating the next generation of sportsmen and women conservationists. And conservation, of course, is one of the reasons we have, well, the sole driving force behind duck stamps. 
I know they're not called that anymore, but that's what we'll call them forever. Duck stamps. And most of us who, um, who buy those know that, uh, number one, the money goes to um, Fish and Wildlife Refuges. That we brought it on ourselves as sportsmen back in the 30s. We decided we needed another tax to help support that kind of stuff. And we said, please, take more of our money. And that's how it worked. And then we buy those stamps partly because we have to and partly because they're beautiful. But did you know during the Trump administration, there was a requirement for that art? And it's all done on a competitive basis. The art had to celebrate our waterfowl hunting heritage. In other words, if you're going to win that contest, there better be a shotgun, a duck call, some shells or something like that in the the painting. I don't think that's such a bad thing, do you? I mean, after all, who's buying them? What does it go for? But the Biden administration says, as of next year, no, no, no. No more icky stuff that might be misconstrued as mean, you know, like a firearm. They want to open it up so that artists have more, quote, freedom of expression without a mandate to include a gun, a dog, or other hunting component. It's just a picture of a bird then, isn't it? All right. Well, you can thank your illustrious president for that one. Okay, off the soapbox and on to business. This part of the Upland Nation podcast is brought to you by Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products. Miner in the truck. They're on the workbench. I use them regularly. Here's the web address, just so you have it handy. Sageandbreaker.com. Everything from gun grease to a cleaning, lubricating, protecting spray. There's shotgun cases, cleaning, and shotgun care gear. Sign up for their mailing list, and you'll get first notice of the new products out there. Sage and breaker.com and our friends in here on south dakota the ringneck nation learn all about their giveaway at hunt huron sd.com three different lodging and restaurant packages i've stayed at all of them i've eaten at all of them you'll enjoy the heck out of it and who doesn't need two more nights in pheasant country yeah in fact huron has more pheasants than people 140,000 acres of public access. Learn more and enter to win. Get your free hunting information packet at Hunt Huron SD. You know, it's funny. Uh, I get on a jag once in a while. I'm interested in things that, um, you know, just intrigue me, and this is one of them. So when I saw an article in a magazine about ptarmigan, no, just making a joke. I know how to I know how to pronounce it. From an expert who actually lives up there among them, I thought that would be fun to talk about. We've gotten snipe, we've got some of the grouses, we get and now here we are. Tarmigan is the top Tarmin let me say that. Tarmigan is the topic. And topic is spelled with a P T. Chris Cunningham joins me from somewhere way up there in the Great White North. Chris, welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. And um, you give us a feel for where you are out there. I am on the Kenai Peninsula, which is southern Alaska, um, about central part of the state. Went up there to try to catch the salmon of my dreams. It's still up there. <laughs> it's still up there. Maybe it's in the ocean now. I hope so. So great place to be this time of year especially i bet you have what 20 hours of daylight or something crazy like that it's waning but it yeah we're 24 hours in the summer and that helps us get through the long dark winter yeah i bet well so does hunting and we're going to start with that tell me a hunting story a hunting story um that's that's easy because we have eight dogs um so we're always hunting with, with either Chocolate Labradors or the English Setters. And um, recent on my mind is probably the 
story of uh, Winchester, who's the king of our hunting dogs. He's the papa of the puppies, as we still call them, even though they're grown now. But he um, he's always been the best. And he was taking us up into the mountains one time. And Steve, my partner, started having some chest pain. And we were about six miles in. And uh, I'm with him. So I'm, oh, my gosh, what's going on? Are you okay? And he was struggling. Um, and there's no cell service. There's you're a two mile drive from the nearest hospital. Um, and Winchester runs up the side of this valley and goes on point. Meanwhile, I'm saying, do we need to go? Should we turn around? Should we go back? And Steve's like, looks up and says, no, no, you, ha you have to honor his point. Ah, and so, ah, <laughs> so a man after my own heart yeah we're I know. Bro brothers and, of another mother i love it <laughs> and, and i'm a little torn <laughs> yeah, yeah, slightly I, slightly yeah. yeah so i i head up the side of this uh this ravine and uh up i go and i'm i'm slow given my adrenaline uh, it takes me we we later look it takes me 20 30 minutes to get up there and winchester never moves uh when I get up to him, he, he kind of gives me that look out of the side of his head, like, what's taking you so long? And, mm -hmm. uh, I end up shooting one of the ptarmigan, a flock flies up, white-tailed ptarmigan, and this ptarmigan just plummets. I mean, it just bounces all the way to the valley below. Um, but it was just such a great story because he's, you know, we follow the dogs and we we – can't uh let them down and and that's what you live for so you have to make that decision and i'm glad i did and that he was okay uh, the dog or him or your partner <laughs> my partner <laughs> they're okay. both okay <laughs> okay and and yes you did shoot a bird and that's that helps a lot too so happy ending in all respects so i'm glad to hear that yeah. um and uh, and uh these birds are uh, intriguing for a lot of reasons, you know, uh, maybe like me, a lot of people are intrigued mainly because it's so far away and it's kind of exotic. Tell us a little bit about ptarmigan. Well, there's three different kinds uh, in the mountains where I hunt, um, down here on the peninsula, there's white tail, rock ptarmigan, and then willows, our state birds, probably the one people are most familiar with uh, or associated with Alaska. And the, the white tail are smaller. They're more like the quail of ptarmigan. And the rock ptarmigan are sort of the bird of the gods. They're, I think of them with their associated big game animals. So like willow are moose, rock ptarmigan are goats, and white tail are sheep. <laughs> because that's, the, that's who they share their habitat with. So um, just to give people an idea of, of what you have to do to go get them. Um, you know, it is it is a big consideration to bring a dog up here. Um, I love hunting with dogs, and uh, it's all, it's hard on them. There, a lot of times they aren't their feet aren't conditioned for those rocky terrains when you go up for the rock or white tail. Um, and it's not like get out of your car and go. You're you're having to take them up into that country, and it's rough and you uh, everything is m a little more extreme or dangerous because you you are remote and you don't have the the supports uh, of civilization nearby um, but it's pretty rewarding the views are phenomenal uh, you you get them for the rest of your life and um, wonderful country and the willow, willow ptarmigan, you know, they can be found along the road system, especially in the interior. Um, also, they're very, they're, all the ptarmigan are just very enchanting birds. I don't, I'm lucky that I've got to spend a lot of time with them. I know people will call them stupid chickens, but <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't love that because they are just, they're funny. Uh, watch them in the breeding season. Uh watch how they they cope and it's just they're cool birds i i really like them you know you um what when we think about them if we think about them at all we always think about them on the on the the tundra you know walking around with hip boots on and sinking in yep. and that sort of thing 
you mentioned rocky habitat and you know frankly i i forgot about all that and, and if we're going to hunt them in the lower 48 that's the only place we're going to find them in the rockies but describe what what else you find in ptarmigan habitat be, besides that besides the the tundra or the yeah tundra? yeah I- uh, in the Rocky, okay, so when you're going for some places, you can find rock ptarmigan in pretty accessible, hilly terrain. Um, but when, when they're up in the rocks, they'll, they'll sometimes gather in big flocks, and you'll end up uh, following them up and up and up. So it kind of reminds you of, like, chucker, like you're, you're maybe cussing under your breath, and you, you keep following them up. But um, the the rocks are, I haven't experienced a lot of rocky terrain in the lower 48, but I imagine it's pretty the same. You know, you're looking at shale slides, you're that sort of slaty uh, moraines, uh, a, lot of gl- a lot of the valleys where we hunt, you know, they were, there were once glaciers there that have scraped out these valleys and there's just big rocks, but in terms of visually, it's uh, a lot of down low in the valley there's a lot of streams cutting through uh, creeks cutting through where you might suspect birds would gather um, and then up high it's, there's there's a lot of times snow that never melts um, that's in the high places so you're you can even see flowers blooming um, you know where there's snow in the same same field of view uh, just it's it's gorgeous country it's rugged a friend's dog um once jumped from a a ledge he called his dog to him and his dog jumped and it was ended up being 30 feet wow i don't know what the dog was thinking maybe he just distorted the the perception he hadn't been in that kind of terrain but it was just a gut punch we were all uh in fear uh the dog turned out to be okay he was hurt he cut himself on a rock but um it it is something to consider when you're when you're taking dogs someplace new it's new for them too and they have to learn sort of the opposite of street smart they have to learn country smart yeah and you know yeah i don't know that you can teach a lot of that they got to learn the hard way i think i was working with (laughs) with my dog uh right before we started talking today and uh, and uh, again i thought okay he he i could tell him what to do in in a specific situation we're training for right now but i think the right way to do that is for him to figure it out now luckily it wasn't jumping off a cliff kind of stuff but but uh your, your dog's got to figure things out once in a while what else do they what are some of the other challenges that a bird dog faces in ptarmigan country i wonder um we took winchester when he was younger to uh, the dakotas to hunt pheasant and i just remember thinking gosh these birds have such a stronger smell than Mm. ptarmigan Uh, the other thing that's hugely different in comparison is ptarmigan are so widely dispersed uh, compared to what you find when you're hunting fields where you can kind of, you know how much area your dog has to work. Up here, you know, a big running dog, if you're going into the mountains, different if you're you're doing other sorts of hunts, but going to the mountains, you need this big running dog to really cover so much more area to find where they are today. I mean, you might get lucky and there they are, (laughs) or, you know, you might cover a whole valley and there's just nothing there you know the the better analog for that might be sharp tails um Mm -hmm. because they're you know they're spread out as anything out there besides huns i think um you ever hunted sharp tails yeah and we have sharp tails in alaska yeah yeah Mm -hmm. um do they uh any similarities uh, in habitat or behavior up there you know, one time one of our dogs did get, uh, I think he got a, a sharp tail and a rough grouse and a spruce grouse in, in the same area. <laughs> uh, and I've, I mean, there's there's all three types of ptarmigan in the same areas in the mountains, too. Um, I guess, and sometimes when you go up north of, of, north in the interior around Delta area, Delta Junction, um, 
a lot of that country looks like uh, farmland. It looks like, you know, with just mountains in the distance. Mm-hmm. It, it definitely, they're farming up there and, and the birds are um, responding in similar ways. You know, they're finding shelter belts and um, there's different habitat that different conservation groups have, have worked on to put up there. And um, we've got a small game biologist that, that or two of them in Alaska that, that, sort of coordinate work um, for our, our birds and kind of give us a report of what's going on with our, you know, the weather and um, how they're doing. So, um, yeah, it's, I guess you have to really see it. It's hard to, it's hard to describe all the different environments that you, you get into where you find birds. Like this is a totally different habitat, but uh, little ptarmigan are, are here too. They move with the snow levels. They move with the, the conditions and the, the seasons and the breeding season, all, all variable. That's Chris Cunningham. I'm Scott Linden. You're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. Glad you could join me, Chris. You know, before we take a break, describe a little bit of the kind of the, the strategy you would employ if you were hunting ptarmigan. And would it differ depending on the species you're after? Um, probably not for me. I mean, the, yeah. my strategy is let the dog out of the vehicle, follow him until he stops. Yeah. Uh, good plan. <laughs> Works for me too. <laughs> In fact, the only time it doesn't work is when I don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so are you, um, starting low and going high or does it matter? Yeah. I, I like to start low and go high. That's definitely the best for me. Um, once I go up, I, I want to come down. (laughs) I love it. Well, we'll get deeper into all of this and a few other things because we can't talk about ptarmigan in Alaska without talking about, uh, brown bears. So, uh, prepare for that. Uh, Christine Cunningham, Cunningham is my guest here at the Upland Nation podcast. She'll be back in just a moment. In the meanwhile, (laughs) It's almost hunting season for most of us. For some, it's been going for a few weeks, including Chris. Uh, The stresses of hunting season uh, will affect your dog in various ways. The good news is Happy Jack has products for all of those affects. Learn more about what they've got to offer to your dog at happyjackinc.com. That's happyjackinc.com. Pads. They got pad coat. I use it every day on a hunt. Cuts, they have seal and heel, which will put a membrane basically over that cut that tastes bad. The dog won't need his cone of shame because he will not like licking that stuff. And finally, for just the ordinary, everyday, bothersome stuff, spray on some skin balm and take care of your dog because he's working hard for you, and that's one way to do it. Learn more at Happy Jack Inc., Dot com. You know, I put these two commercials together, I guess, subconsciously because they're both about taking good care of your hunting partner. Rough Land Kennels, that's spelled R-U-F-F, Land Kennels, RoughLandKennels.com. Designed and built by a dog guy, my friend Doug Sangle. One of the many things that he has done to make your life easier and your dogs more comfortable is raising the floor about an inch and a half. So anything that gets spilled in there or he comes in wet and he drains off, all of that stuff goes to the edges and will help your dog stay more comfortable. If you got an SUV instead of a pickup, they have designed a dog crate that will fit into that little notch right behind the seat. It's got a slanted back. You're getting maximum room for your dog without wasting any space in your SUV. Roughlandkennels.com. Learn more over there. And right now, let's learn more about ptarmigan hunting, etc. from Christine Cunningham. Chris, you still there? I'm still here. Good. Um, we uh, I mentioned it, so let's get it off our chest once and for all. Uh, what's th- what's the real risk of a brown bear encounter with our bird dogs up there? Uh, I think it's a real a real good real good chance of of an encounter with a bear, uh, depending on when you're up here. Um, 
since we're here year round, we're, we're here with the dogs up in the mountain when they wake up and then probably seen, um, I've probably seen 10 different bears this year. Um, but with that said, I'm most of the time they, they don't want to have anything to do with your dog. And we put a bell on our dogs and uh, they know they're there and usually move along. Um, I, I don't, I'm not really afraid of a encounter uh, going bad. <laughs> so, um, but, but it is a real, uh, seeing a bear is a real thing. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to respond to that without thinking, yeah, I'd rather not. But yeah. <laughs> but it's a fact of life up there. At least you don't have to deal with rattlesnakes. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about how you train a dog for this. Is it any different than any other bird? Are you um, working on specific things? Well, I'm. All of our dogs learned on wild birds. Um, we didn't have the the benefit of of a lot of facilities for training up here. There there are some bird dog groups, but. Um, Mostly, I think it's more fair to say that uh, I learned everything from the dog. <laughs> they might have training techniques uh, that they use on me. Mm -hmm. um, but I, yeah, I don't know. I think for ptarmigan, there, um, you know, obviously there's going to be differences. I'm not an expert at the differences because ptarmigan's mostly what I know and and grouse. Uh, we have spruce grouse here and uh, sharp tail, but um, mostly, I mean, it just seems like, seems really similar to anywhere else. Your your dog finds the bird, they point them, um, and, and you walk up and flush the bird. I will say that uh, the white tail up here are really reluctant to flush. Um, so that is, is one thing that I've experienced that you know, they're, they're hard to get up. So yeah, by, by being reluctant to flush, are you saying they're going to run instead or are they going to stand still and hope that uh, you will just go away? <laughs> they're going to they're gonna hunker down. Oh. Uh, they, they won't get up at all. Um, wow. And that serves them well. We had a incredible encounter a few years back where uh, this group of really young uh, white tails was, was hunkered into the, into the lichen just super tight and they were young birds so we weren't really interested in shooting them it was first week of the season uh, it opened so early up here uh, so m my partner Steve was getting down there to make a photo and um, this uh, you know birds wouldn't go I mean he is just like he's making micro photos uh, he's so close it looked like he was nose to nose with this little young uh, white tail and then after we're done, we we decide we'll just flush the birds. Winchester is, it seems like he really wants to point him. He's not that dog that gets mad at you when you miss or don't shoot a bird or something. But sometimes I'll shoot to make him think I, I shot, but I'm just flushing the birds. Mm -hmm. uh, but he, so I go to flush the birds and I do. Um, and a, a peregrine falcon just swoops in and hits this bird so hard. <laughs> It just busts into feathers in the sky. And we were like, that's why they were hungered down so close. I remember that well. I thanked a golden eagle at the end of one chucker hunt for uh, yeah. the, the only limit I've ever had. <laughs> yeah. I, they watch the dogs, too. That's been real interesting to to experience. I agree. I watched that not, not a week ago. I was uh, running out behind our place where I train almost every day. And I noticed a kestrel of all birds following my dog. And he'd go from s snag to snag, just waiting for my dog to put something in the air for him. Never worked, but they figured this stuff out, haven't they? Mm -hmm. I think so. There's a there's an old relationship there. Yeah, and they don't know the difference between a an English setter or a German wire hare and a coyote. They're all the same to them. Right. Um, How did you get involved in this whole world? Uh, what got you started hunting? Well, I, I started duck hunting as an adult. Um, Steve, my partner, was, was really interested in getting back into it after his 
uh, career and taken a long break from it. It was what he loved most as a kid. So I, I wanted to go kind of invite myself along. We were duck hunters. I got obsessed about it. I loved duck hunting, uh, loved the dogs. And then one year I'm MC at a Duck Unlimited banquet and they pull out this 28 gauge and nobody's bidding on it. It's a gorgeous gun. It's Beretta. It's just beautiful. Um, so I had a, a couple drinks and start the bidding. <laughs> <laughs> Funny <laughs> how that works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty soon I'm the owner of this lovely, most expensive gun I ever ha had owned. Um, and so I walk back kind of sheepishly to see who's standing in the back of the room. And he says, you know what this means? And I'm thinking, I don't know what this means. And he says, well, now that you have a proper upland gun, you're going to have to get a proper upland dog. <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> this point, uh, yeah, at this point, um, all I knew about uh, upland hunting was sort of, you know, spruce grouse. Uh, you know, you, you shoot them with a twenty two, um, and, you know, you have a good dinner. I didn't really know about this whole wonderful world of, of upland dogs and, and the traditions and all of that. So um, uh, we got Winchester. He's a Havelock setter. Uh, from North Dakota, and he showed up at the airport, and uh, we got to work um, training him or learning from him, and whichever it was both, um, and we started going into the mountains, and it just was such an incredible uh, world to see, uh, you know, behind a dog. It was just gorgeous, and uh, so I'm really glad that gun was worth a lot more than I paid yeah, it, it's funny how that works. Uh, mine was ass backwards from that. Got the dog, <laughs> then got the gun, but the uh, same thing and ultimately mm -hmm. wrote a book about it. So what have the dogs taught you? Oh, gosh, the dogs have taught me so many things. Some of them are hunting related, but mm -hmm. um, some of them, they're more like just life things. I, I love the nature of dogs and, and hunting dogs in particular. Setters are so different from labs, and they're they're more sensitive, it seems, the ones I've experienced, and um, just their boundaries and the way they, you know, they have these different uh, senses and in, in enjoying the, their skills in the field and how they approach a day, always happy, always ready to go, um, living for those moments. Um, and I think that some of us, you know, we get – we go out hunting exactly for that reason to get free from, for us, it's civilization for them. It's, you know, domestication, but uh, it's nice to, to be wild and free and hunting is one of the last freedoms we have left. And that's true for us and dogs. So I love, um, I guess I learn from them, but it's more like maybe I'm learning with them. We're kind of having these adventures together, growing up together, uh, and, and what they know about the birds is, you know, I, I, like you mentioned earlier, you know, following your dog and sometimes I'll get in these arguments. There's not birds there. That's where you going over there for get back over here. And I'm always wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, we joke about it. You know, once the tailgate drops, uh, the, the hunter with the longest nose is really in charge. Yeah, I think so. Usually that's a dog. Yeah, <laughs> we don't. Well, well, in all of your hunting experience, and and yes, the, gr the grouses as well, and and e even the, the sharpies out there. What what is a lesson you've learned about um, about anything? Working with a dog, strategy, tactics, any of that stuff that you, you don't think maybe we have figured out yet? You ever had a light bulb moment like that? Hmm. Wow. I'm scratching my head to think of if do you have one and then I can <laughs> see if I got anything like it. <laughs> I, that was it. Uh, follow the hunter with the longest nose. Yeah, that that's served me well for eleven seasons on television. I think that's plenty good for me. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, a good one. I, I think maybe um I guess mine is that they they do not, uh, that you have to be there for them. You sort of have to be their, um, their mind or, or head because they, they don't have that sort of, 
uh, break like wild animals do where you know they're not going to spend themselves so completely you know wild animals can't afford to run a whole mountain valley for a bird they're going to be more uh, lean and economical and efficient in their movements and behaviors whereas your dog is just going to go bananas because there's a big you know cooked meal at home at the end of the day at least at my house and so I think that one thing I've had to learn is not to just trust them so completely, but it's sort of like a give and take, like, okay, you find them, but I'm going to tell you when, when you're too close to the road or when you need to stop or when we're done, because you know, you might not be registering the full, full limp that you have, but I can see it in your body because I'm always paying attention in a mental way and, and you're paying attention you the dog um not that you're a dog but <laughs> your dog is uh always paying attention in this more sensual way so it's it's really a great partnership i like to think that the dog is sort of a medium between the truly wild and and what we experience in our lives so it's it's just really a beautiful uh relationship to to constantly see play out and to be a part of and that's learning and so many moments it's hard to pick just one it's like any moment anytime you're out there together doing it that's it yeah you know it's funny what you said and and i agree with it i think to a to a great degree the dogs uh either help us interpret what's going on out there in the wild world or they at least help us see it so we can figure it out eventually but they are a linkage uh between the two worlds and and i'd never thought about that before you ought to write a story about that <laughs> what about having eight dogs? I mean, what is the biggest challenge with a, with a string that big besides the feed bill? <laughs> well, I think it's the, just the different personalities. We've had as many as 11 in the house, um, so we're down to eight. Um, but the, the different personalities, it's interesting, all their little quirks and um, sort of being the, the people in charge of, of all the behavior, but um, yeah, setters are funny. I think they're quirkier than most, but uh, the thing about having these personal space bubbles and how they don't seem to want to transgress on each other's space means that there's lots of like blockages at stairs and halls and dog doors. <laughs> and they're just standing there waiting for <laughs> some the other dog's politeness meter to to kick in and let them know that they need to pass and you you end up being like their butler like excuse you please um colt would like to go outside now he's been waiting you know th thank you i'm going to steal that line <laughs> and use it over and over i think through even not as not to the degree cats do but do dogs also uh think they deserve a butler every once in a while don't they <laughs> yeah do you, have, yeah. do you ever hunt hunt um, both breeds together, for example, to use your labs as flushing dogs on these points or anything like that? Yes, but it doesn't. It's not like yeah. you would imagine. <laughs> no, no, I, I can very well imagine. I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it could be handy in, in a few cases. You know, you talk about all these birds that don't want to fly. I would imagine uh, they, they could be motivated by what they might think is a brown bear. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The, I, I, I like it in theory and I keep trying it out. Yeah. And yet you're not going to do it again <laughs> if you can help it. Right? Oh, yeah, right. I get it. Okay. So uh, not, not that anybody listening cares. No, that's just a little joke. Why all Brown Labradors? Gosh, maybe it's just what your first love becomes mm -hmm. your I don't know. They're, um, I love them. I, uh, I just have in my mind this archetype of a, of a duck dog and it, it's a chocolate Labrador and I can't get that out of my head. So I'm married to it. <laughs> oh yeah. Literally. <laughs> no, not, not, <laughs> yeah. pardon me. <laughs> I, uh, you know, um, I was a musician and played way more operas than i care to but in, in an article i read by you you describe oh i guess i'll call it the find in the point uh by one of your pointing dogs as an aria from an opera what do you yeah, yeah but you can't just leave it at that tell us more oh my gosh well 
I, I don't know. I, I don't have like this great uh, expertise in music, but I do love opera. And when I watch the dog work, it there's music to their work. And especially when it's on a scale so large, you know, a mountain valley or a big, a big field, you, you just have this, this canvas, if it were a painting or this, this space to fill and they fill it. And it's really, they're just this artist and they're on fire going, doing what they love full throttle. And it definitely has um, tempo to it. And cadence and pace and all these things that are musical and yet there's there's no music but you you tend to and we lack the vocabulary to probably say this as well as it could as we mean it but it's very musical and you and especially setters their body movements are so graceful like almost like ballet they have this very you know centered I watch a lab run and you cannot balance a book on any of my lab's heads, but you, you watch a setter run and you're like, gosh, you could put a book on his head. He's just so high and light on his feet and, and uh, hugged into his, his center of gravity and there he goes. And it's very controlled and beautiful. So I, I watch this and it's, you know, the visual feast aspect of it. You're just like, Whoa, my gosh, what am I watching here? It's the best show on earth. And, and it has a, a musical score. I, the best dream I ever had, I, I joke around with people. I'm like, I had a dream one time that was so good that credits rolled at the end. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, when, when we are done, you and I, I'm going to be talking about dog dreams next. So stick around, everybody. <laughs> we'll find out what Christine Cunningham really was thinking about when she had that dream, all coming up on the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, the host. I'm intrigued with that for all the reasons you might guess, plus my musical background. But, you know, it's it, it's just fascinating to me as well. We, we catch ourselves watching the dog so much sometimes all the other stuff like mounting the gun and shooting uh just go by the wayside have you ever been that miss i was gonna say mystified but dazzled by your dog you forgot to shoot <laughs> uh i don't know if i forgot to shoot but i've definitely been so impressed that i i lost the I mean, it, it overtook the point of why I was out there. <laughs> um, people will tease me sometimes, well, you don't take that many birds. And, and it's true. Um, you know, people think of Alaska as this, this abundant place, and we don't have a, a lot of game. I mean, it's also very poor in terms of environment. Uh, so I, we don't take a lot of birds. Um, it's, so it's, it's not really, um, I'm not, the, the bag is not so important to me as, as sort of this larger work, which is, you know, this big question that I think we'll spend our lives trying to figure out, you know, why do we do this? Why do we love this? Why are we who we are? And why does it have to be hunters? And, and I think it's because, and especially for upland hunting, which is a lot like fly fishing, it's because there's so much uh, beauty and grace and, and there's, all these wonderful values, the, the honor and the tradition and the, the skill of the dogs, they're, they're fine arts. And um, yeah, it, it, in, in shooting the gun is, is not so fine, but it is an art. Uh, the shotgun is, is an art. So, well, and, yeah. and, and it is the, it, it's just like I've described it this way. You don't watch a football, you don't watch the, the, the quarterback uh, sink back into the pocket throw the 80 yard pass and then cut to commercial. You, you got to watch the guy catch the damn thing. And, yeah. and fly fishing is the same way. And, you know, a lot of folks, including I have described it with standard cliche. It's a three dimensional chess game. And, and your description of uh, dog work as music is in the same, it's in the same category. These are incredibly, perceptive ways of describing what some people might look at as a very prosaic activity. You're, you're really just walking around and the dog's running around. Well, yeah, I guess, but, but you've described it so much better than that. Absolutely. I think that's how we feel it. It's, it's so much better. Than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
it's it's all through and 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 more on top of that and and man we could keep going forever and ever i have one practical question for you though especially with somebody with eight dogs um what do you, what is the the one piece of equipment that you might have for eight dogs for training or care or something else that maybe none of us have thought about because we just got one measly dog to deal with oh um hmm, uh, for separate dogs um, I don't know they all have their own dog bed um so they all have their own little places. Wow. I think of what <laughs> what someone in my circumstances would want. If you have eight dogs, you should get a... Um, um, psychiatrist, probably. Psychiatrist. <laughs> no, I, that wasn't all a setup just for that corny joke, mm-hmm. but but it's probably also true. But, the, probably true. Uh, but they're also, for the record, everybody, dogs are way better therapy than most of those so-called professionals out there. Um, but, you know... Uh, what about advice for us? I mean, uh, in general, I don't know if I can, I don't know if you can top it. I mean, you're, you're so articulate and you've described so much of this in ways that I've never heard before, but let's just say you're talking to somebody who said, you know, I thought about taking up bird hunting at one point and I didn't do it. What would you respond to them? Well, I understand why someone wouldn't do it because there's so much involved, but it's really in, as simple as if you love dogs, I think you would love hunting because that's a love that just opens up so many other things. And I think that it's really for the love of the dog that a lot of us do a lot of what we do, even long after the original thrill of the hunt or need to hunt for food for those that do, um, you know, get their, fill their freezer with their big game and then also their small game. I, I think it really, there's a lot of attention nowadays about uh, being a meat hunter or hunting for meat um, and how, how that's such a, a clean and healthy thing to do. But there's also a spiritual value to hunting that is not for everyone, but for those who who choose to do it and live a life that has a lot of time outside and with and companionship with a partner or a dog. There's trust there, and and it's that irreplaceable value that you instill in yourself when you you work through things together. You learn things together, and there's survival tools. So they're not just silly things, um, they're meaningful things, and that meaning flows and grows. So will you feel that the first time? I think some people are lucky and it's like they get this aha moment. I did um, out there on the flat and through the swamp. But um, I, the upland hunting thing is, is really just a cool world. You, you want to go into a, something that's super cool, that's limitless, that's deep. Uh, this is it. And if you want to you know do it elmer fudd style too that's um, also that's also possible oh i can't i couldn't say it better um i've enjoyed every minute of this christine cunningham up there on the kenai one of my favorite places outside of the spot i'm sitting in right now that is um enjoyed the whole discussion thank you so much for being a part of the upland nation podcast and uh, hopefully we'll see you in the field sometime. Sounds good. Thank you. And uh, we've got a little bit more to cover around here. Uh, I mentioned dog dreams, and I'll be d- addressing that right now because I found it fascinating. And if you enjoyed our discussion of late, you'll probably find the same thing. Do you dream of your dog? Well, Researchers at Heidelberg University, that's in Germany, of course, discovered that people who own dogs tend to have more positive dog-related dreams than those who don't or who have had bad experiences with dogs. Yeah, I know. Now, the highest percentage of doggy dreams came from people who allowed their pets to share their beds. All right, just put yourself in Christine's place for a moment. Eight dogs 
you got to have a lot of beds to do that. Anyway, according to the research, dogs show up on average in 5% of the average person's dreams. But in dog owners, it's 19%. Now, the only comparable figure is the amount of time a romantic partner shows up in a dream. Yeah, it about 19% as well. Yeah, don't go there especially if she or he is listening as well. So the bigger question is, what, uh, what is your dog doing and what does it mean? Well, that's a, you know, obviously speculative, but here's what the researchers say. If you're dreaming of a dog that's hunting or digging, you are searching for something and haven't quite found it yet. All right, enough about that. And as Freud said, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. We have a public access segment coming up. Kansas Bob White's in just a moment. But first, let me remind you that this part of the Upland Nation podcast is brought to you by Dr. Tim's Natural Premium Dog Food. D-R-T-I-M-S is where you learn all about the ingredients, the importance of the things that he puts in that other people don't, and vice versa. For example, if there's an artificial color in your dog's food, and you can tell that because there's a number after it, you probably ought to wonder what else is in there. Artificial colors, artificial flavors, Oh, man, don't get me started. Just go learn about all that at Dr. Tim's Natural Premium Dog Food, D-R-T-I-M-S. If you're ready to switch, it's pretty simple. He's even got instructions for that. It's just a matter of a few days. Free delivery, 30% discount on your first order. Just use the code UplandNation, D-R-T-I-M-S dot com. This land is our land. Okay, sorry, Woody Guthrie. I changed the lyrics slightly. But it's true. Even in a state like Kansas. You know I love Kansas. I made a half dozen or more TV series, TV shows there over the years. One of the more fascinating birds there is the little one, the bobwhite. Here's a quick primer on some of the places you might take a look at going say later in the season when every place else is really cold the melbourne wildlife area lots of potential there the state is full of privately owned walk-in access so get a hold of the online hunting atlas take a look at the southeast and the northeast for quail well bob white quail The Red Hills often has a good population, especially if the weather has been favorable. And the area around Abilene, Kansas. That's a gateway to the Flint Hills and always worth a look. All right, so that little bit has been brought to you by findbirdhuntingspots.com. I put something new up every week there to help you hunt train and care for your dog right now download the ultimate upland checklist that'll make sure you don't forget anything the next time you head out or the first time you head up for the season could be a shotgun could be a sleeping bag and sorry flick it might have been a dog And on that note, I'll thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please tell one friend. I appreciate that. And if you got a couple more minutes, please leave a review at Apple Podcasts. We're always talking at the Wing Shooting USA and the Upland Nation Facebook pages, so I'll see you there. I'll leave you with this. Nobody will take credit for this one, but it is golden. Write it down. Turn it into a bumper sticker if you like. Choosing a dog may be the only chance you get to pick a relative. I'm Scott Linden. Thanks for listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'll see you in the field. <laughs>